Several months ago, I was contacted by a man who said he had a story to tell. The details, he said, would take me into a world of secrets and shadows. For months now, I've been in contact with a man referred to in this programme as Martin. Our meetings have always been discreet and carefully planned. Because Martin was a spy who brought special branch deep within the IRA and Sinn Féin. His story begins in July 1997. The IRA has issued a statement announcing what it calls a complete restoration of its ceasefire. The IRA's guns were officially silent, but a secret intelligence war continued. Around this time, Martin, an IRA and Sinn Féin member, says he contacted the RUC's confidential telephone service. He's agreed to exclusively tell his story to Spotlight on an anonymous basis. He can't be identified because he fears for his safety. I did it to prevent another outbreak of violence along the lines we've had for in excess of 25 years. Don't want to go back there. And because of that, any means are justified. 3,000 people killed. One life saved that would have been worth it. A meeting was arranged and that was the start of regular meetings. Usually the means of arranging a meeting were a phone call on the mobile phone. And they would ask, well they would suggest a rendezvous point to which I would drive to. And then I would park a car and go somewhere with them in their car, and basically that's the way it happened all the time. Few agents within the IRA have ever stepped forward to tell their story of betrayal. In 2006, Dennis Donaldson, a former senior Sinn Féin official, was murdered just months after admitting that he had been spying on the IRA for two decades. I was recruited in the 1980s after particularly after compromising myself during a vulnerable time in my life. Since then I have worked for British Intelligence and the RUC PSNI Special Branch. Over that period I was paid money. Dennis Donaldson's confession went beyond the personal. His admission went to the heart of the secret intelligence war between the IRA and the state. Tonight we examine the influence well-placed agents like Donaldson had inside the IRA. We reveal what he did not tell his spymasters and new allegations as to who sanctioned his murder. In talking to Special Branch, Martin was following in a long line of informers and agents within the Republican movement. But the stakes were high. For decades, the IRA dumped the bodies of suspected informers in border ditches. The body was found in the back of a Peugeot 305 van. In 1987, Belfast taxi driver Charlie McElmurray was murdered by the IRA. They claimed he'd been a paid RUC informer since his arrest last October, but today... The... His local priest said the IRA had made itself the arbiter of moral law. Charlie McElmurray had been abducted by the security forces and left dead with a hood over his head and his hands bound. There would have been a mighty hue and cry. The criticism was met with a defence of the IRA's so-called summary justice. Mr. Michael Murray, like anyone else living in West Belfast, knows that the consequence uh, for informing is death. During the conflict, the IRA murdered over 60 people it accused of secretly working for the army, the RUC or intelligence agencies. 
The IRA said it had shot him. It claimed he was an Irish special branch informer. IRA claimed he'd been an informer since 1981. Claimed he'd been passing information to the police. This morning he was found dead there. The IRA claimed she'd been working as an informer for the police for two years. By 1997, some may have thought an IRA ceasefire ruled out any action against suspected informers. But Martin and his handlers were fully aware of the risk he was taking. My handlers would have given me good advice and a bit of training. But it's just basically be very, very careful with yourself and how you go about things. I would have been nervous uh, driving to public places uh, for fear someone would see me there and wondering what I was doing well away from the normal places I would go to. And that would perhaps make them suspicious. So I was always very cautious, and very strict about security. And of course the places we would have met would have been picked with that in mind. For decades, agents and informers undermined the IRA from the inside. But the scale of infiltration has rarely been acknowledged. In 2008, Dennis Bradley and other members of the Commission on the Past travelled to London to examine an archive of classified government documents. It's an archive of most of the of our troubles, particularly the big traumatic events. And it's an archive also of that world of intelligence and who was running intelligence and who were the informers and who was in charge of it and so forth. At any one time, the security services were running about 800 informers at any one time throughout the troubles. Now that's a lot of people within a, a small community of people. In fact, security sources have told Spotlight that the figure of 800 is an underestimate and is closer to the total number of special branch informers and agents in Belfast alone. The overall assumptions is that loyalism was easy, that you know the loyalists kind of signed up, that there was no great difficulty. What was surprising is that um, there appears to have been actually a very large number of people who were informants, were being paid or were giving information uh, on the Republican side. And that the infiltration into the Republican and the IRA was much greater than most of us had uh, known. Despite its tight cell structure, Informers were rife within the IRA. I do think that Sinn Féin, the IRA, created a myth about that there were a group of people who were Republicans. Different from anybody else, they were a group unto themselves. They were people with human flesh, with weaknesses, and I think that the intelligence services used those weaknesses, now looking back, to a, to a degree greater than perhaps we expected. Agents and informers provided a window into the IRA's internal discussions and organisation. But the IRA was watching back. It too, for decades, was using intelligence to gain the upper hand over its opponents. As part of its counterintelligence strategy, the IRA targeted and blackmailed people in positions of authority like the police and prison service. We did see indicators at times, as it were, of uh, uh, individuals coming under pressure to pass on information or attempts being made to cultivate them. Those that we did identify, both within the civil service, the prison service, the police service, the military even, those people were all uh, taken out of positions that uh, they were in, some were dismissed, others were. A limited number maybe went forward for prosecution, but um, sometimes you, by prosecuting, educate the opposition too much as to what you know about them, and those people were quietly sidelined and put into different positions and jobs or else out of the job altogether. Mm -hmm. 
In the shadow of the peace process, the IRA's intelligence gathering capabilities came under the spotlight. A case in the late 1990s gave Special Branch an insight into a particular IRA intelligence gathering strategy, the use of so-called clean skins. Persons with no apparent militant Republican connections recruited to collect information for the IRA. In 1998, a young school teacher was convicted of spying for the IRA. Rosa McLaughlin was just one part of a much bigger IRA spy ring that targeted key or UC personnel and police stations. But she wasn't known to the police until she was spotted in the company of this man, Bobby Story. Bobby Story is one of the most prominent individuals within the Republican movement. At a protest against Jerry Adams' arrest two years ago, he paraphrased the Sinn Féin president's famous remark about the IRA. We have a message for the British government, for the Irish government, for the cabal that's out there. We ain't going away, you know. In 1979, Bobby Story was arrested in London following a helicopter attempt to free the late IRA leader Brian Keenan from Brixton Prison. He was acquitted but was subsequently sentenced to 18 years following a gun attack on two British soldiers. He was credited with playing a crucial role in the 1983 May's prison escape. After his final release from jail in 1998, he became the IRA's Director of Intelligence. Known as Big Bobby, his activities and associations were of huge interest to Special Branch. Martin was one of those they used to spy on his activities. What did you understand Bobby Story's role was at that time within the IRA? Oh, I knew what his role was. His role was Director of Intelligence within the IRA. In Northern Ireland, Martin says he was always looking over his shoulder and to minimise the risk of exposure, he says he was often debriefed by his handlers in England. Procedure would be that you would fly out of one of the airports. They would ring you and they would talk you into, say, central London, for example. you would get another phone call to say, now I want you to go over and buy a paper. And then when you got to that point, you would notice a special branch officer on the side of the road and he would tell you to follow him at a safe distance. He would walk you into some hotel and walk you into some room where special branch were waiting for me. At this stage, Martin was no longer an informer, providing information in a passive sense. He was now an agent. He targeted specific individuals at the request of his handlers and did exactly what he was told. Special Branch would always have half a dozen points to give me whenever I would have met them. And these would have been about individuals, you know, had I seen them. Was I speaking to them? What was I saying? That, that type of thing. I would be fortunate enough to talk, to bump into the right people who were in the inner circles. Dennis Donaldson was also in the so-called inner circle. Dennis was a warm and friendly person. He was cheery. He was very loyal and very trusting and very intelligent person. Dennis Donaldson earned his IRA credentials in 1970 during the so-called Battle of St. Matthews in the Short Strand, regarded as the IRA's first major engagement of the conflict. He was interned along with figures like Jerry Adams and Bobby Sands. He later served time for IRA bombing offences and spoke about his experiences in this 1977 documentary. It's a political war, and the men are political prisoners. Uh, their actions, which any in the room, they're, they're guilty. 
They're in there because of their actions, which were politically motivated. What does any young man who is 16, 17 or 18 know who's, you know, he comes from a ghetto. Uh, they don't normally read as a pastime. But uh, whenever they come into prison, like prison encourages them to read, probably because there's little else to do. And uh, obviously they come under the influence of others of who are probably more uh, more aware, if you like, of you know the political causes. Donaldson went on to travel the world for the IRA. He built up links with foreign revolutionary groups, which could supply the IRA with weapons and training. In the late 1980s, he was dispatched to New York to work with Martin Galvin of Irish Northern Aid. A leading member of the American group NORAID, which raises money for Irish Republican causes, has been arrested and flown out of Northern Ireland on an RAF flight. NORAID's former publicity director says he suspected Donaldson was not what he appeared to be. He would answer the phone, use his own name, talk about things that I thought were, would attract attention from the FBI or from anybody who might be listening on the phone. I thought that he was an agent. I complained a number of times to high-ranking people in Ireland and was told, try to get along with him. Uh, Dennis has impeccable army credentials. I must be wrong. I must be mistaken. It could not be true. And the more things I told about him, that look, you have to work with him, trust him for our sake, for Ireland's sake, for the movement's sake, try and get along with him and work with him. Dennis Donaldson later established a U.S. branch of the fundraising group Friends of Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin's new office in Washington will consolidate their presence here and act as a launching pad for their political advancement. On his return to Belfast, he worked closely with senior IRA and Sinn Féin figures. A party insider told Spotlight that he was a fixer, someone who sorted out problems. He also actively recruited on behalf of the IRA and all the time, he was also an agent of British intelligence. Dennis Donaldson was an agent of influence. His key value as an agent was not the secrets he disclosed, but the subtle influence he could bring to bear when key decisions were being taken by those at the top of the IRA and Sinn Féin. And agents of influence were among the most valuable assets of British intelligence inside the IRA. The IRA was broken up into nine, I think, different structures or different levels of operations. So agents had to be selected and, and if possible, placed or, or manipulated into certain positions uh, and allowed to develop and grow. A well-placed and long-term agent could silently damage the IRA from the inside. If you looked upon agents, uh, and there was a, they're sort of a cancer within. Uh, a slow-growing cancer. They can, they can sort of infect, as I say, other parts of the system. Long-term agents of influence, like Donaldson, were the state's foot soldiers in a counterinsurgency strategy that some believe contributed to the strategic defeat of the IRA. The intelligence world played an immense part in bringing about, shall we say, a realisation within the provisional IRA that they had passed the post in terms of the armed conflict. I think we won the intelligence war. The war we lost was the propaganda war. The propaganda side we lost uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of what is mythology now about, you know, uh, the, oh, the dirty war theories. But there are many who believe that it was a dirty war. It happened in the shadows and it contains many more secrets than, than people might believe exist. Well, it happened in the shadows, but we operated as a police force accountable to the law. If there had been a dirty war, then ask yourself a simple question. Well, if you're fighting a dirty war with uh, no restrictions, who would you be tackling? 
the entire provisional army council basically came through the war untouched but as a counterintelligence strategy was it important that the army council and its membership although fluid remained generally intact so that those individuals or people close to those individuals could be could be targeted for recruitment well, yes uh, that, that aspect of it is there that when that sort of certainty was there in relation to it. Now, the, the Army Council was made up of people who, shall we say, of varying abilities, uh, of varying influence. And once you knew those abilities and influences, then obviously, uh, you're quite right, those that sort of uh, moved in their midst um, or, as I say, uh, uh, attended to their needs or were able to sort of uh, make commentary in their presence. All those things had a collective influence over a period of time. They sowed seeds of doubt. Uh, they encouraged ideas that were, shall we say, uh, more of a political uh, desire as opposed to a military desire. For decades, the OUC Special Branch, the Army, the Security Services, as well as the Guardi, and at times the FBI, all ran agents within the IRA and the Republican movement at large. Security sources have told Spotlight that by 1994, a majority of the seven-person IRA Army Council were effectively compromised because of their proximity to high-level agents. The Army Council's decisions were, they said, influenced by IRA insiders who were also secret agents of the state. Lord Alex Carlyle most recently served as the government's independent reviewer of national security arrangements in Northern Ireland. It's very common for good security services and good police on special operations to achieve high levels of infiltration. I wasn't surprised at the level and success of um, information gathering. We've been able to move to constitutionalism in a shorter time than I expected when I first became involved in these issues in 01 as independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. I think Northern Ireland represents a political success. I think the effectiveness of the intelligence services may have been a factor in moving former terrorists to a constitutional path. Lord Carlyle also encountered Dennis Donaldson who was then Sinn Féin's head of administration in Stormont. I first met Dennis Donaldson when he was effectively the manager of the Sinn Féin parliamentary office in Stormont. I visited him, I had a conversation with him, and um, he helped me with one or two um, journeys that I made in, in Northern Ireland. In my role as independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, I didn't know that he had uh, any other role. The same rang true for Martin. He says he had no idea that Donaldson, like him, was an agent of the state. Let's be clear about this. They would never tell you about anybody being an informer. They would never tell you anything about that. That's how they operate. You'll never know who the other informers are. Dennis Donaldson was paid to betray the Republican movement but he also kept secrets from his handlers. He did not tell them about a chef he befriended in New York and helped move to Belfast, Larry Zajcek. Larry had worked in some of New York's best restaurants. In Belfast, he ended up working in the canteen of Castlereagh Police Station. Spotlight understands that Dennis Donaldson encouraged him to apply for the role. In Castle Ray, the man who became known as Larry the Chef was so popular that he catered for parties at the homes of senior police officers. He also used the gym in Castle Ray, close to what was called the 220 office. At times, he even used the photocopier in that office. 220 
was a hub for special branch operations, a round-the-clock contact point for agents. On St. Patrick's Night 2002, three intruders raided Castle Ray's 220 office. Dozens of highly sensitive documents were stolen, including the code names of paramilitary agents, their handlers, as well as a persons of interest register. Castle Ray Police Station was sealed off all day after last night's security breach. Alan McQuillan was then an assistant chief constable. It's hard to understand the blow this was, how bad it was and how shocking it was. Not only that we had been burgled, but Special Branch had been burgled. Pretty soon it became clear who was involved. We had various sources reporting, and as a result of the information that was coming into us, we knew with absolute clarity that it was the IRA. Bobby Story, the IRA's Director of Intelligence, was identified by police as the so-called mastermind behind the raid at Castle Ray. Larry the Chef, police believed, was the IRA's inside man. They had spent a huge amount of time developing this over a period of time, you know, with the chef, getting the chef in. And he was allowed to bring guests into the premises and we believe that he arrived at the premises with people who were carrying counterfeit army ID cards. Larry Zajcik had returned to New York, but investigators uncovered what they believed was evidence connecting him to an IRA intelligence gathering unit. The PSNI began to make a case for extradition. In New York, Larry Zajcik always protested his innocence. I was falsely accused of taking part in the break-in at Castle Ray. The break-in took place at the office that housed the Special Branch's 24-hour hotline for its informers and their handlers. It was a highly political act and one that had absolutely nothing to do with me. Okay, so I have become the PSNI's scapegoat for their own dirty dealings. Special Branch uncovered Donaldson's connection to the American chef after the break-in. Their agent was the very man who had brought Larry Zajcik to Belfast in the first place. It cast doubts on Donaldson's reliability and whose agenda he was ultimately working for, his spy masters or the IRA. Larry Zajcik wasn't the only secret Donaldson kept from his handlers. He knew about an IRA spying at the heart of government, but for reasons that remain unexplained, he again failed to tell his handlers. However, Special Branch had another agent who did. The most striking information out of all the information that I would have got from Dennis Donaldson was, was in connection with the so-called Stormont Gate spying. As a member of Sinn Féin, I would meet Dennis from time to time. And during those conversations, Dennis let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. And he told me about the documentation that he was taking out of Stormont. Dennis told me that they were stealing sensitive documents from the NIO office at Stormont, and that it had been going on for some time. He didn't specify what kind of material they were taking. All I know was what he said was that they were taking stuff that was important. Crucially, it was Martin who told his handlers about an IRA spy ring at Stormont. The common belief is that Dennis Donaldson gave Special Branch the information about the spy ring up at Stormont. Dennis Donaldson wasn't the person. I know he wasn't. I was the person that tipped the police off about the spy ring at Stormont. Can you recall the reaction of, of your handlers when you told them about the Stormont spy ring? They got very excited from being laid back and dead casual, almost lethargic in the car. 
They set up and they perked up all of a sudden when I mentioned that and got very enlivened and excited about it. And that was that. That was the start of fainting out more. That was the start of concentrating on one subject from then on. For the next 12 months, I seemed to work entirely on that and nothing else but that subject and what was happening in Stormont. Based on source information, the police began a major investigation into an IRA intelligence gathering operation. We had identified that there was a major spy ring. And we had identified that they had managed to penetrate the Northern Ireland office, um, various other government agencies and bodies and public bodies. They were stealing large amounts of information. And our objective was quite simple. Um, to catch them with that information and to bring as many of them to court as we could, and particularly the Director and Controller of Intelligence for the IRA. Bobby Storey was the main target of a major covert surveillance operation, codenamed Operation Torsion. Special Branch and MI5 bugged a laptop computer and a rucksack and tracked both as they were moved between IRA safe houses. We were throwing everything we had at this. This was so important. Um, I mean, we, we, we knew, for example, that they had stolen the entire HR database of the prison service. So there were 3,000 prison officers and they got their names and addresses and telephone numbers. And we knew that they had all their documents. We didn't know the full scale and scope of it. For months, Special Branch and MI5 were watching and listening to the IRA and receiving updates from their inside man. I reported regularly over months, and I know why they waited so long. One, hopefully to catch those involved red-handed. But more importantly, they wanted to arrest Bobby's story in the act of carrying some of the stolen documentation. By early October, the PSNI were on the brink of making their move. Whose call was it to move at the particular time that, that the PSNI did? Mine. Me and me alone. But having looked at everything and said, no, we can't sustain this much longer. Right, we will go tomorrow. I then went and saw the Chief Constable and explained to him where we were and what we were going to do and the possible implications of that. And Hugh's position was quite simple. This is going to have big political ramifications. We both knew that. We're cops. We do what cops do. We're investigating crime. Go and investigate the crime. Hours before the raids, Martin says he met his handlers. The night before the police raided the homes of Dennis Donaldson and others and Stormont, I'd met my handlers just to confirm to them certain addresses. Donaldson was on the brink of arrest, something that could jeopardise his status as an agent. But Spotlight understands that he was now considered to be a rogue agent. He had not told his handlers about the spy ring and the relationship was about to be terminated. At first light, the PSNI made their move. The rucksack which had been bugged led the police to Dennis Donaldson's home. Dennis Donaldson wasn't the target. The satchel that was on his house was the target. It's a bit like past the parcel. Unfortunately for Dennis, he was holding the parcel when we moved. But there was a problem. Computer disks the PSNI had expected to find were missing, and a decision was then made to search Donaldson's office at Stormont. I phoned Hugh and said, look, this is the situation. We have to search the office at Stormont. I'm going to instruct them to do that as a goal commander. It's my decision. And he said, fine, I support you. We do what we have to do, but we'll do it, let's do it low key. So, I went back and sent a message to them to say, right, I need this done in a very low-key message way. I want some non-uniform officers to go up and search the office, and I want it done on this basis so we do the minimum public show on this. 
The search at Stormont was anything but low-key. Drama at the doors of democracy. Easy, lad. This is a Sinn Féin minister, and these are the police who have just finished raiding her party's offices at Parliament buildings. I had forgotten that the only search trained officers were uniform officers. Another commander in Belfast said, I can't do this because it's contrary to force orders. I have to use uniform officers. So he sent uniform officers to do the search. And I didn't find out about that until it was too late. I feel bad about that because I should have supervised it more. But um, that's where a mistake was made and that was our fault. The so-called Stormont Gate scandal ultimately changed the course of politics in Northern Ireland when just a week later, the Assembly was suspended and direct rule reimposed. Sam Pollock, a former chief executive of the police ombudsman, is one of many who believe that the raids were deliberately calculated to collapse the institutions. The timing of Stormont Gate, the encouragement, the advice and the civil service, uh, Northern Ireland office, London, was very clear. Trimble had, in a sense, passed his sell-by date. And senior civil servants were being encouraged to, quote unquote, bring the DUP and Sinn Féin in from the cold. But Alan McQuillan insists that the police operation was not influenced by politics. I was quite aware that this it was likely that this might precipitate a collapse of the assembly because that would be the impact of on unionist politics. But the um, the the line that we'd agreed was look, we know this is going on. There's serious unlawful activity going on here. We can't just let this drift. We're going to address it. And as I said, he was very firm that politics aren't a matter for us. We do what cops do. The material recovered gave the PSNI a remarkable insight into the IRA. You had a, a huge mix of documents here. You had government documents that have been stolen by the IRA. You had material generated inside the IRA, their own intelligence records. They required all their intelligence units in the different areas in Northern Ireland to, to type up a report every month and send it into the centre summarising what they've been doing. And these were all kept in a folder in the rucksack. So you pull out a little folder in relation to, say, Fermanagh, and there was all the things they've been doing for the last 12 months set out in pages of A4. Very hard day. It was shocking in terms of the scale and extent of what we went through found. The hall included a map and codes of the entire security system at the Northern Ireland office, aerial photos of army bases, personal, including sexual details about Unionist politicians. The IRA's own documents showed that it had its own live network of so-called friendlies, people working in a wide range of government departments and public bodies all feeding back information to the IRA. I do recall being briefed that this had caused absolute consternation within the whole Republican movement. I mean, we came within a nace of her arresting exactly who we wanted to. We didn't quite get there, but um, it was very shocking for them too, I think. Dennis Donaldson and his son-in-law, Kieran Kearney, were among those arrested. However, the target of the operation, Bobby Story, was not detained. We did manage to arrest him. That was just a fact of life. You have to play a long game in these things. And uh, we broke up the cartel. So it's not just about prosecuting people, it's about stopping crime as well. In a solicitor's statement, Bobby Story refuted all the allegations in this programme. Dennis Donaldson, Kieran Kearney and another man were later charged with having documents likely to be of use to terrorists. Jerry Adams and supporters gathered outside the court. I'm sure that in the fullness of time, when all the uh, dust settles down, that Dennis Donaldson will walk free. 
Jerry Adams' prediction proved correct. In late 2005, the so-called Stormont Gate case unexpectedly collapsed. Kieran Kearney, Dennis Donaldson and another man were acquitted of all charges. Full disclosure in court would have compromised Dennis Donaldson. Spotlight understands that the case collapsed in order to keep his role as an agent a secret. But Donaldson gave nothing away and stuck to the Sinn Féin party line. We were looking forward to a trial because we were confident from the outset that even if the case had have gone to a full trial, that we would have been found not guilty. Would you be happy to come back and work here after what's happened the past couple of years? Um, I'd work anywhere that the party asked me to work. Doesn't matter whether it's Stormont or the Falls Road Sinn Féin office. But Donaldson's secrets were about to be his downfall. The next evening, uniformed PSNI officers visited Donaldson's home to deliver a threat notification message, what's called a PM1. It reportedly stated that members of the media believed he was an informant. The police had a statutory duty to report such a threat. In this case, they also had a duty of care towards their agent. It must have been very difficult for the uh police or the security services to know what to do in any situation where uh, there's a risk to an informer being uh, exposed then the police would be uh, very proactive in moving that person to secure uh, to a safe place um, probably out of the jurisdiction and giving them lifelong protection and support and that's a duty of care I would have apprehensions as to how quickly they cut clean um, from Dennis and left him in a situation that was um, transparently uh, uh, hopeless in my view. Um, uh, he was completely vulnerable um, from whatever, it doesn't matter who killed him, um, it was almost predictable. The police ombudsman is reinvestigating a number of issues relating to Dennis Donaldson's case, including the background to the threat message and how he was warned that his cover was about to be blown. Dennis Donaldson was at a crossroads. We simply don't know and may never know why he didn't seek the protection of the state. Instead, he turned to the Republican movement, the people he had betrayed for decades. In a meeting two days later at this Sinn Féin office, he was asked directly if he was an agent of the state. Jerry Adams was in the same building that day. The Donaldson meeting had been arranged at the request of the IRA, which planned to interrogate him at another location if he did not confess. Dennis Donaldson came clean. His double life was at an end. Four days later, Gerry Adams publicly announced that Donaldson was a British agent. He described the revelation as a scoop. Sorry we didn't give you the scoop. You'll know that, uh, that our party has expelled uh, Dennis Donaldson, who's a, a long-standing member after we uncovered, uh, and he admitted, that uh, he was working as a British agent. The Sinn Féin president continued to deny there had ever been a spy ring at Stormont. There was no Sinn Féin spy ring at Stormont. And then when we saw different people uh, being arrested and charged, uh, I certainly instinctively knew that there was somebody wrong in the middle of it. Hours later, Dennis Donaldson, accompanied by his solicitor, read out his prepared statement. My name is Dennis Donaldson. I worked as a Sinn Féin Assembly Group Administrator in Parliament buildings at the time of the PSNI raid on the Sinn Féin offices in October 2002, the so-called Stormont Gate affair. I was a British agent at the time. Dennis Donaldson Martin says, 
had signed his own death warrant. As soon as he uttered the words, I knew that he would be killed. Because that's the only, well, that's the only sentence or penalty that you can get for traitory. Donaldson also denied there had ever been an IRA spy ring. I was not involved in any Republican spy ring in Stormont. The so-called Stormont Gate affair was a scam and a fiction. It never existed. It was created by Special Branch. I deeply regret my activities with British intelligence and RUC PSNI Special Branch. I apologize to anyone who has suffered as a result of my activities, as well as to my former comrades, and especially to my family, who have become victims in all of this. Donaldson's statement sent shockwaves throughout the Republican movement. Even Martin, his IRA and Sinn Féin colleague and fellow state agent, was taken aback. It was a terrible shock. Dennis would have been one of the least people you'd ever expect to be an informer. I don't know any informer that was ever spurred. They were all executed. And I think regardless of whatever speculation you may have heard about Dennis, they always intended to kill him. And for what he'd done and to set an example to other informers or would-be informers, Dennis Donaldson moved to Donegal, where he continued to be debriefed by Republicans about his role as an agent. He never returned to Belfast, despite public assurances from senior Republicans that he was safe to do so. He can do whatever he wants, uh, frankly, uh, and that's something that, that he has to work out. He has no fear from um, Republicans. But Donaldson's admission had angered many within the IRA, and in particular, South Armagh. Donaldson helped to set up Sinn Féin structures in South Armagh. At times, he was also an intermediary between IRA leaders there and the Republican leadership in Belfast. Few outsiders were ever trusted by the IRA in South Armagh, but Donaldson was on the word of senior Republicans in Belfast. Sources told Spotlight that following Donaldson's admission that he was a British agent, the IRA in South Armagh began to blame him for operations that had been compromised. It's claimed that they also suspected that he had planted a number of covert listening devices that they had uncovered on different occasions. Both Republican and security sources told us that the IRA in South Armagh was pushing for action against Donaldson. In Donegal, Donaldson was living on borrowed time. For almost three months, Donaldson remained under the public radar until the Sunday World journalist Hugh Jordan tracked him down to this cottage and secretly recorded their conversation. I was thinking that the press conference in Dublin was so short that you never get a chance to say too much. Well, what I said is what I said. Uh, well, what it holds for the future for you now, then? Well, this is it, yeah. And then you go. Right. How did you find out that Dennis Donaldson was living in Donegal? I met a man in Belfast um, wh whom I knew for many years. Was it a police contact? Was it a security services contact? No, it, 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 it wasn't. It was, it was a, a man with a <clears throat> very Republican ideas. I drove from Gidor down to Glenties and was uh, snooping around, not really getting very far. And I was sitting reading the Irish Times in my car and I suddenly glanced up and down the main street in Glenties was Dennis Donaldson crossing the road. I couldn't believe my eyes. Dennis Donaldson told you, Jordan, that now his whereabouts were known, he would be leaving. Well, I'm not to stand here too long now. What can you do now? I don't know. Hugh Jordan was accused of setting Donaldson up for murder. The responsibility for 
uh, Dennis Donaldson's death lies solely with the people who pulled the trigger the night he was murdered, no one else. Do you think that your article may have focused the minds of his murderers? The, the article may just have been the, the catalyst that uh, it was time for him to go. I th th looking back, I think his fate was sealed. It was a question of when were they going to do it. Two weeks later, Donaldson was murdered. Sinn Féin official Dennis Donaldson has been found shot dead near Glenties in County Donegal. In a statement days later, the IRA denied any involvement. But security sources told Spotlight that intelligence received after Donaldson's murder from covert surveillance and agents contradicted the IRA's denial. Spotlight understands that the South Armagh IRA leader Thomas Slab Murphy insisted that Donaldson be killed in order to maintain army discipline and that the IRA in South Armagh commissioned the operation that led to Donaldson's death. What's less clear, according to sources, is who carried out the operation that resulted in his death. Martin says he also told his special branch handlers what he had learned about the murder. Not too long after Dennis was murdered, I was told by a member of the IRA, an active member of the IRA, that the IRA had killed Dennis, not anybody else. I gave that information to the special branch. What was your, your handler's reaction to, to that information? They were just totally mute. There wasn't any acknowledgement of what I'd said. Subject was changed to something else. Were you surprised? No. I think they knew themselves. You see, I just think that, you know, they and the whole status quo had seen Dennis's death as internal housekeeping. And they were happy enough to put up with that. I believe that they acted on some information and didn't act on other information because it was too politically sensitive to do so. Martin believes that the shooting of Dennis Donaldson was sanctioned by the man at the top of the Republican movement, Jerry Adams. Spotlight understands that by 2006, Jerry Adams had stepped aside from the IRA Army Council. But Martin claims that Adams was consulted on all matters. I know from my experience in the IRA that murders have to be approved by the leadership. Well, they have to be given approval by the leadership of the IRA, the political leadership of the IRA and the military leadership of the IRA. Who are you specifically referring to? Jerry Adams. He gives a final say. In a statement, Jerry Adams' solicitor said his client had no knowledge of and no involvement whatsoever in Dennis Donaldson's killing. He added his client categorically denies he was consulted about what he describes as an alleged IRA Army Council decision or that he had the final say on what had been sanctioned. In 2009, the dissident Republican group The Real IRA claimed responsibility for Donaldson's murder, but Martin is dismissive of the claim. I believe the real IRA who claimed that three years later did it for the kudos. A forlorn hope that someone might take them more seriously these days. They enhance their reputation and try and repair a tarnished image which has evolved. Dennis Donaldson's death is the subject of an ongoing murder investigation in the Republic. In July, a 74-year-old man was charged with withholding information in connection with his murder. Spotlight understands that the Garda investigation is focused on a separate individual, originally from County Donegal, now based outside the Republic, who has been described as sympathetic to dissident republicanism.
14 years on, no one has ever been prosecuted for the break-in at Castlereagh Police Station. The case against Larry Zajcek, accused of involvement, collapsed in 2009. He continues to strongly deny his involvement in the break-in to this day. We traced Larry Zajcek to his own restaurant business. He declined to be interviewed on camera. He said what had happened was a long time ago and he has moved on with his life. Martin also moved on. He says he stopped working for Special Branch in the years after Donaldson's death. I stopped because I didn't feel there was anything left to give them. It came to an end at my request. They were quite happy about that and thanked me for all, for years of service. I have absolutely no regrets about my time working as an agent for the state. I'd do it tomorrow if I had to. Dennis Donaldson took his secrets about his double life to his grave, a journal that he was encouraged to write by Republicans as part of his debriefing process is being retained by Gardaí. Spotlight understands that Donaldson wrote about himself and others, as well as what he did as an IRA man and as an agent of British intelligence. Spotlight also understands that relevant information from Donaldson's private journal has been made available to the police ombudsman's investigators. Their report is expected to be published later this year. Dennis Donaldson openly admitted his role as an agent, but the identities of other Republican informers and agents during the decades of conflict remain highly classified. Dennis Bradley says that full disclosure would come at a cost too big for society to absorb. When I and others were involved in doing the past, there was strong representation that all these files should be thrown open. It's an argument we heard and, and rejected. We think that the hurt of that is too great and that it should not be inflicted on this society. You're talking about a lot of families and you bring more and more, more and more pain into that type of situation. Britain's counter-terrorism strategy in Northern Ireland was so successful, some say, that it forced the IRA to rethink its military campaign. In a sense, the intelligence war brought the protagonists to the table. They applied all the technology that was at their disposal. They, they gave it, uh, as they would see it, uh, their best shot. Uh, it didn't work, and I think that realisation came home to the IRA leadership uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. The security side won in that respect. Uh, thereafter, politics, in a sense, took over. Informers and agents not only betrayed the IRA's secrets, but some were used over decades to influence its strategy at the highest level. For Republicans, the scale of infiltration within the IRA raises uncomfortable questions. Was the IRA rendered ineffectual by many of its own, members who were also informers and agents of the state? Did the secret intelligence war force the IRA to renounce violence? Did spies within its own ranks bring the IRA in from the cold?